everybody and welcome once again to All Things Irish and Rock and Roll. I'm Benny White and we do hope still that you're enjoying uh, these interviews we bring you with people from Ireland who made a great impact uh, back in the 60s and 70s. Now when I mention the name Norman Teeling, you would normally associate it with um, paintings. He is a wonderful painter, great artist and one of Ireland's most successful painters. But few people, except musicians, know that he was quite formidable when he used to play guitar. And he still does, by the way. But uh, he was there right at the top. And uh, we got him, we talked to him, and you're going to hear Norman's story. It's very interesting, and uh, we hope you enjoy it. Norman Teeley. Yeah, uh, before Elvis, as, as John Ennan said, there was nothing. Well, it's, it's not true, really, but... He was so original. I remember uh, we were listening to people like uh, Bing Crosby, Perry Como, Doris Day. That was that was the music of the day. And then uh, out of nowhere, well, of course, Elvis gets a lot, gets a lot of credit for being the first, but he wasn't really because Bill Haley is really the king of rock and roll because he uh, he was before anybody. And, and I, I was a little kid, and Rock Around the Clock came out, and. Uh, the movies came out. He made movies. Even this was before Elvis was heard of. And I remember uh, some of the cinemas in town showed uh, Blackboard Jungle, which was uh, a film with Glenn Ford about teenagers in America, high school. And uh, they wrecked the cinema. That was, that was the... They mm. did it in England, so they had, of course, do it over mm. here in the Royal. Mm. I, I was too young at the time. I, I was only about maybe nine or ten. But I remember that, like Bill Haley. And then... Elvis came along a couple of years after that. And uh, the thing about Elvis that got me more than anything, it wasn't so much his singing, it was his guitar. And I, uh, on the way to school, uh, I used to get a bus. I was living in Finglas at the time. And uh, I used to get the bus over to Belgrove School in Clontarf. And uh, there was a, a Parlophone or Parlamount movie uh, shop in Abbey Street. And it was a big poster of Elvis with his big jumbo. And I used to just stand there and I'd be looking at the guitar, it just, it just fascinated me, the whole shape, the look of it. I said, God, I'd love to have one of those. I'd just love to have one. I couldn't play it. I didn't know anything about how to play it even, but I, I wanted to get one. So I, <laughs> I got a bit of plywood and I got a hatchet and I, I hadn't even got a saw. And I chopped out the, the shape of the guitar and uh, out of the plywood. And I hung it up and uh, when I got it, nailed it together with basic nails and a hammer, hammered away, put it up on the, over my bedroom. And I, rem I remember there was a carnival uh, just up the road from where I was staying and they were playing Elvis uh, all shook up over their PA over the whole uh, over the whole you could hear it all over the whole all fingerless Elvis and they just kept playing this one record and I was looking, lying on the bed looking at my guitar and I was saying God this is this is the life you know I think I was about 12 at the time so it was my ambition of course to get a guitar I gotta get a guitar I got, somehow I beg, borrow, steal I gotta get one so a friend of mine uh, St. John Connolly He's uh, passed on now, but he had he had a little wooden guitar. I was this about maybe I was about thirteen at this day. It took me two years to even even see a real guitar. So uh, he had one, so he gave me uh, a loan of it, and I wouldn't give it back to him. <laughs> so uh, we we had a bit of a fight about that, and uh, eventually uh, there was no there was no strings on it. It just looked good. I just, it was the, more the look than the feel yeah. because I couldn't play it. But it was all about the look, and I thought it was Elvis. <laughs> Didn't we all? <laughs> uh, everybody thought they were Elvis, of course. Anyway, uh, that was my first uh, <clears throat> contact with the guitar, and eventually I got one. Uh, I was in the I was in the uh, the art college at the time. I, I was about fifteen years of age, and I was a young guy. I can't remember his name now, but he he uh, had a, a real guitar. This was the this the first guitar I ever got. So I swapped two albums, an Elvis Presley album and a Gene Vincent album. For it. we made a deal. We we're going to trade electric uh, uh, no this was an acoustic guitar it was a Woolworth special three quid but it didn't matter to me anyway uh, we made a swap and I took it home and I was uh, at this stage I was a big time into the Everly Brothers I, I just loved their big jumbo so I, I cut out a little piece of plastic to, tr to put onto this guitar to make it look like uh, one of the Everly Brothers jumbos anyway I went back to, into school the next day and uh, he comes back to me with the two albums he said I want my guitar back <laughs> and I wouldn't give it to him so we had a fight. We went out and we, we were fighting in the in the uh, out in the yard, and 
beating the head off each other. I always, I always remember there's blood everywhere. We were, I was wrecked, but he never got back to his guitar mm-hmm. again. But mm-hmm. uh, I had for many years, and, and that was my first uh, introduction to the guitar. And then, of course, learned a few chords over the years. And like everybody, you know, in the, back then you hadn't got, you know, uh, the internet to kind of suss out uh, chords or anything. You had to just le- you just taught yourself basically. And it took might, maybe it might take you maybe a year to learn three chords. Like you can learn them in a night now, but back then that's the way it was. It was just it was just a, a slower it was a slower time as as you know. So uh, I, I eventually did manage to get a, a kind of a copy of a Strat because I was big time into the shadows. They were they were kind of they were out of Apache. This is 1960 and they were they were kind of really uh, uh, the big thing, the shadows. So and the fact that I wore glasses <coughs> was a great help. I looked a bit like Hank, you see, so I got into uh, playing, learn the shadow stuff. So the, <coughs> the shadows were probably the first real guitar heroes of mine. <coughs> then I uh, back then there wasn't a lot of, gu- of instrumental music. I, I wasn't into singing. I was mostly into just playing, in, playing the guitar and been interested in in uh, guitar music rather than vocals, uh, so I remember I uh, started to get listen to other forms of guitar playing by by Wes Montgomery. I was into jazz, anything I had guitar on it, I was into. Mm-hmm. So we'd have the you have the Ventures, you'd have Chet Atkins, he was a big big uh, idol of mine. Uh, then you'd have all the jazz guys and uh, the you know the Shadows, etc. And uh, I, I I so. In one way, it was it was great here in Ireland because we were kind of isolated from mm. the real music scene outside you know, England and America, and we I mean you kind of became a very versatile, and it applied to all the musicians here in Ireland. We were really amazing uh, that that we had to adopt to every form of music, and it was a great education for musicians here in Ireland because we we learned to play you know uh, just about anything that came out, and you developed your ear and you you know. Well, if, if I was li- maybe living in England, I would have got into a band and started writing songs and probably never listened to anybody else. And you'd be just into your own stuff. Well, the Irish musicians are, you know, they're, they're, I think they're very talented in, in that respect because they can play about just about anything, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, basically, that was it. And I just, the 60s came along and I just joined the queue. Well, I remember I did a lot of gigs before the beat scene. I was playing around. The first gig I ever did was out in... Uh, in Holt, it was in the tennis club, and uh, I had a little group. We call ourselves the Leaves. I was about fifteen, and uh, I remember we no drummer, and my friend Sinjin, he was another guitar player. He he sacrificed playing the guitar to play drums. So all he had was a chair and two knitting needles, <laughs> and uh, so you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> what we sounded like anyway I, I was I, I remember coming on the stage and I was really nervous and I, I, st- I stood the whole the whole gig we went back to the audience <laughs> playing uh, we played I think we had six numbers and we played them about five times each and uh, that was the first gig and then of course the, the whole beat scene started up here in Ireland kind of we were kind of copycatting what went on in England and we had a kind of our cavern was the five club mm. in Harcourt Street you remember that place yeah. and uh, it was kind of like that was the place to play that was the in place back then about 1965 66 and i went I, the first time i went to the five club uh, i remember uh, the atmosphere was fantastic it was it was kind of sweaty dark and you know and, and uh, the lights were really you know down and the, the first band i remember seeing in there and they were really good was uh, the the what they called the vampires mm-hmm. or uh, uh, Tony Kenny but that Tony, Kenny, Tony Kenny and I, I was standing at the side of the stage and uh, I thought they were great you know Len Guest on, on guitar and that was fa- oh, that, that was a different band wasn't that was the Strangers wasn't it? But they, they, were on as, they were on as well the same yeah. night mm. and uh, so it was my kind of ambition then to get a gig there and, and uh, I had a band with uh, uh, called The Planets we used to play out in, in, in Chapel Is It in the cinema before the film and we'd get up and we'd uh, do our usual. Uh, the Beatles kind of had just a bit clicked down, so we were the doing like. The Oriel Cinema, was The Oriel Cinema, yeah, up the hill. We used to play there before the film every Saturday night. We were there for about six months. And that was, that was, that was a residency, you know, <laughs> before the movie. It was like the old music hall days with the piano player. Uh, that, 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 was, that was the first band, I was a uh, real band. Then I joined a show band. I, yeah, I joined a show band uh, called The Statesmen. And I was with them. Uh, for about maybe a year, uh, and th- they were actually very good. There were there were guys out of that used to be the brass section w- used to be uh, in the 
Artane Boys Band, and they were really great musicians. But I, 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 I was in the. It was like two bands with a little combo of the rockers on the right hand side and the brass on the on the left hand side, mm. and uh, they be, they be wanting to do you know tequila, and I wanted to do like I saw her standing there, or whatever you know, mm. and uh, so uh, but. Uh, I kind of felt uncomfortable because I, I was kind of like, you look to the right and you see five people, you look to the left and you see another five. And you, it was like being in the army or something. Yeah. To me, I, I, I just felt a bit claustrophobic, you know. So I, I, uh, I left. I, I just had enough of it. And I formed a band uh, called uh, The Difference. Uh, with, uh, the manager was Larry Mooney. And, uh, he, right, this, this, yeah, God rest him, yeah. But anyway, uh, we were no different than anybody else, really. But uh, we called ourselves The Difference, just to be different. Anyway, uh, uh, we played in the Five Club, and uh, I remember it, the atmosphere there was, was, like I said, was the place. But we also played in a place called Club Arthur. Yeah. You might remember that. It was on the, it was on the quay there, and I remember we supported Rory Gallagher, uh, and he, uh, you know, was a t he, he. We were doing all covers. We did all, you know, the uh, the Beatles and the Stones and you name it, all that kind of stuff. And he came on and he was, this would have been the later 60s now, probably around 67, 68. And he come down from Cork and he was, uh, he was in Club Arthur and he was the main act at the time. But I remember watching him and saying to myself, Christ, that, that guy is, you know, is really unusual. He was different. He, he was doing all his own stuff. He hardly did any original stuff or he did all original stuff, no, no covers. And I said, that's, that there's something about that and the sound of his guitar. So I decided, I said, I, I went up to him and I asked him, like, how did you get that sound? Because he had the same guitar as I had the Strat and the same amp, but but I couldn't get that sound. Mm. I said, and so he showed me, he had this little box, <coughs> which uh, was called a Range Master, yeah. which uh, uh, I think, believe it or not, there's a guy here in Ireland who used to make them for him, uh, Frank Boylan. Frank was a bit of an electrical electronic wizard. Yeah. And Frank... I remember I used to make make these little range masters. Uh, they're actually better than the originals, believe it or not. And uh, Rory used to use one of Frank's uh, range masters. Mm -hmm. So I, I got one uh, uh, off Frank. It was a fuzz pedal, wasn't it? Yeah, no, it was no, no, I, I, what, no, it was actually a treble booster. Treble it, it, booster it, it wasn't, it wasn't a fuzz. It, all mm -hmm. it did was it just boost. It made the the, the amp. The thing about a, 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 a Vox AC30 is that it's got a very fat sound, but it's no volume. But when you plug in this uh, the guitar through the Range Master, you get this kind of a big sound. Now you might, you're thinking back then there was no such thing as a as a, a hundred watt amp. You know uh, it, that's all kind of accepted now as though as though you know, it's run of the mill. But back then there wasn't. So you, you, we did everything in our power to make ourselves sound louder <coughs> because it, because of the crowds and you know you. Uh, would absorb the sound, so you just didn't have the PA system. That didn't come to later with Hendrix and and uh, Fleetwood Mac. They brought in the the Orange amps and the Marshall amps. They weren't around at that time, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, the Vox AC thirties. Anyway, I got a Range Master, and I was and I used it all the time, and it was it was uh, it just gave me this kind of really gutsy sound that Rory had, and all the great blues he heads had. You see, and uh, I was using that for many years, and then. I formed a band, or I was in a band called Zardoz in the uh, mid 70s, that would have been, with a guy called Eric Murray. He was a kind of show band head and a fantastic singer, but his taste in music wouldn't be, to say the least, the same as mine, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, he didn't want me to be using pedals because he, he was used to guys playing a very clean sound like like uh, Hank Marvin, you know, that beautiful tone with echo and nice and laid back. And I was, uh, I was, because I was young, I was only about maybe 20 at the time. And uh, I remember I wanted to, I wanted to be like uh, Hendrix, you know, he was my, he just come, about come out of that stage. And uh, can you imagine trying to be Jimi Hendrix in a, in a show band? <laughs> anyway, um, uh, so I, 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 Eric said, if you want to be in this band, because it was his band, uh, you'll have to get rid of that range master. So uh, I, I said, what am I going to do? I, I can't play with it. I, I need it, you know. I, I said to myself, I didn't want to say it to him because I had to pretend I was a great guitar player. <laughs> I thought I could play anything. So uh, I hid it in the back of the amp. And uh, I used to, you know, when we were doing certain numbers. Is this uh, the Revolution Club? Uh, well, like, well, the, it, it, yeah, well this, would have, this, this would have been the Revolution Club and probably the uh, would have been the Countdown maybe. Mm. And if various, was the, the club scene at that stage was kind of dying mm -hmm. slowly disco was kind of creeping in you know so uh eric says uh get rid of the range master so i 
I said, okay, no problem, Eric, I'll get rid of it. So I, but I wasn't going to do that. I put it in the back of the amp. And I, uh, of course, it was a little, there was a little button at the top of it. And you, you, you had to, normally you put it on the ground and you stand on it. So I used to have to put my hand at the back of the amp while he wasn't looking. And then press the button and then boom, up come the volume. <laughs> uh, uh, so anyway, I remember one night, uh, for some strange reason, Eric was singing my way or something, you know, and, and it went, <laughs> I was strumming the chords and by accident, the range master just clicked in and suddenly he got this, <laughs> all, what is it, uh, <laughs> this deep purple <laughs> chord <laughs> coming across <laughs> my way and Eric gave me this dirty look and, uh, you know, uh, that was, I, I just looked at him and I said, I don't know what went wrong, you know, uh, but anyway, uh, he told me to get, he found out what it was, so I left the band and I said, I had enough of this, I can't, I'm cracking up. So I formed another band, uh, band number 50, uh, and I went down to, uh, we had a, a residency down in uh, John Rogerson's Key in Kelly's, and uh, on a Friday night, it was there for about a year or so, and uh, everybody used to come down, Philip Donnelly and uh, Don Baker and even Phil Lind, and everybody used to come down and jam with us, you know. Mm. And we, I, I was in my element down there. I was doing uh, Hendrix was the main guy at the time, you know. Mm. And uh, I was doing all my Hendrix and Perth, you know. Uh, use, he used a wah wah pedal, and I kind of got into the wah wah, which is a kind of an effect that you can hit a note, and then you can bring the pedal up, and it comes wow. And he used he, he used to be able to use it in such a way that it, it sounded like the guitar was talking. Mm. And, he, and he, he's a master at it, you know. He could kind of wow, wow, all this beautiful, fantastic. So I had myself one of those pedals, and uh, I, I got used to using it. And I had a, my, it became my sound. I was using this pedal, and I was, and plus the range master, of course, mm. and a few of the bits and pieces that I used to plug into to get to get this colossal sound. Anyway, this was going on for months and months and months, and and playing away and having, you know playing all these Hendrix numbers, a few originals and so on and so on. And then one night, I remember this uh, distinctly, I was, uh, the, the the battery in the Wawa went dead and uh, everything just suddenly stopped and all I had was just a, a pure sound and I couldn't play. Yeah. I said, you know, I remember I had to go, it was halfway through the gig and I had to finish the gig with, with, with a, a, an actual guitar sound, <laughs> not, a, not a motorbike, you know. So I said to myself, I, what has happened to me? I, I can't play the guitar. I'm not able to play. There's something wrong. I, you know, my, my whole sound was depending yeah. on this bloody pedal, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I said to myself, if you're going to, if you're going to, you know, uh, continue on with this, you're just going to end up like another guy on a motorbike. You're not going to sound like a guitar. So I remember when the gig was over, I picked up the, the, the range master and I picked up the Wawa pedal. And I went over to the Liffey because we was running down. I just threw them in the Liffey. And I said, man, you got to get, you got to go home and practice because you're crap, you know. <laughs> so uh, I did. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I packed it in. And I, 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 at this stage, I was kind of getting into jazz and big, big time. Wes Montgomery, Joe Pass, all the, the, the jazz heads. Mm -hmm. And I was be kind of becoming a semi-intellectual <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> pseudo, of course, a yeah. uh, guitar player. So I, I yeah. Uh, Started to practice jazz and I formed a little jazz group then. I, I had enough, I, I kind of got sick of freaking out and sick of distortion, sick of wah was the whole thing. After, you know, I, I was getting older actually, you know, I just mm. lost interest. Mm. So I, I started to uh, practice the old uh, jazz and then I kind of got back into the guitar and tried to improve myself. And, and uh, it took me maybe 40, 30 or 40 years before I bought a uh, set of pedals again, you know, wah wah. And, it was, and I, I used it a couple of times, but I have it under control now. I you had a little recording studio as well. I had, and yeah. You yeah. had some uh, mm. great musicians up like well, I Jimmy had, Faulkner. Mm. Yeah. I, I believe it or not, I had Dosh Nagel, you know Dosh? Yeah. Dosh uh, Nagel brought Phil in it down. God rest him, uh, to record in my little studio. Of course, Jimmy. And Jimmy Faulkner, of course. And uh, right. he, was in, he was in that band, Hot Foot at the time. They recorded a couple of tracks down there. And uh, it was, you know, uh, it was something else I got into for a while, but I, I kind of like I, I'm, I was more I'm more interested in the music end of it than the recording end. Of it. You know, we all w had a dream. The reason why I wanted to have a studio was I wanted to be like Chet Atkins, who had his own studio. I wanted to, and I recorded a couple of albums on my own, you know, guitar mm -hmm. stuff. And I've always kind of been guitar, 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 like obsessed, you might say, you know. And uh, of course, in between all of this as well, Norman, you you uh, mm. what's this about Mister Universe? 
Mr. Universe, yeah. Tell so us about that. <laughs> well, yeah, well, uh, I, 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 was, I was probably the healthiest uh, musician in Ireland because when I was about 14 or so, I got, I got into bodybuilding. I mean, obviously, looking at my magnificent physique, you'd, kn you'd know. So uh, uh, he, uh, there's a guy called Steve Reeves. He made these movies, a big a bodybuilder. And he was, I, I saw him, I said, I want to look like that, you see. Uh, I never did, of course, but that's not, that's not the point. Uh, but he, what, he, what it did for me is introduced me into looking after myself. Like, I never drank, I never smoked, took drugs, nothing like that. And I, I got into the health end of, of because part of being a bodybuilder and, and training weights, you had to watch your diet. So at a very young age, like back in the mid 60s, I started, I was only about maybe 16 when I started doing weight training. So uh, I used to bring along my uh, packed lunch I was, because I was training in the gyms. I was bringing along uh, my vitamins, and my packed lunches and uh, to the gigs. Uh, well, to the cinema as well, of course, <laughs> I'm sitting there with a, with a banana sandwich and a bottle of milk watching. Uh, Kirk Douglas on a movie or something yeah. but anyway uh, uh, I used to bring my vitamins to the gigs you know and I'd be making up these these drinks and the other guys would be sitting there drinking their beer and drinking their you know whiskey whatever it was and I'd be taking my vitamins you know? <laughs> uh, kind of kind of crazy but it, 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 but it stood to me throughout my life because I've I've never I've never stopped I've, I'm still training every day I uh, I go to the gym every single day seven days a week and uh I did a lot of jogging. As a matter of fact, I used to do a lot of jogging with uh, Bruce Shields. We used to run down the beach. He used to bring his band along uh, the next morning after he gave. They might be playing down in Cork somewhere and he'd bring the band uh, out for a jog. You know? <laughs> and uh, Joe Staunton and uh, Nolik Bridgman, Noel Bridgman yeah. and uh, John Brady and myself and Bruce Shields would, would, would uh, run along Dollymount Beach, you know, yeah. and... Uh, We'd run the full length now. This was no joke. And, and Brush, being a very, very fit guy, uh, uh, the two of us were the only two to actually survive. <laughs> and the two egos of Brush and myself trying to beat each other, you know? Mm. Uh, uh, and of course, now, now yeah. uh, you're uh, a very successful painter. <clears throat> well, they are. Well, it's like, I don't know whether you, you realise it, but a lot of uh, musicians, particularly, not so much maybe Irish ones, but a lot of English ones, uh, went to our college. It seemed to be the thing you read about every clap went to our college. John Lennon went to our college. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Pete Towns and all these guys. Uh, it's, it's art kind of like, and and music seemed to they go, do go hand in hand. I was no exception. I was just I was fortunate that I I, I was a dunce in school. I went to Rap Mines College of Commerce, and uh, I might as well be sitting in you know, <laughs> mm. uh, in a field for all I was interested in. I, I, but I was there was an art class there, and I and I wanted to uh, get myself. Uh, involved in, in becoming something other than an accountant or a banker or because I but you hadn't a clue about mm -hmm. anyway I uh, got into the art college my dad brought me to the art college when I was 15 uh, took me out of school uh, out of the because I just no interest got into the art college at a young age and uh, I spent about 8 years there did all the courses did everything I was even teaching art for about 12 years and that was that, that that's kind of been kind of like the parallel to the music. I've kind of brought that through the whole thing with the training. So I kind of had my own kind of little individual path through life, you might say, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been very lucky, very fortunate that I, that I did well. Norman, we always ask our interview ease this mm. question. Have you any regrets about being in the music scene since you started? Well, I'll tell you, I have one. Uh, one of the guys that I played with, uh, a guy called Paul Kyo, uh, he was the rhythm guitarist in The Planets and uh, in, the di in The Difference with me. And he went over to London. He left uh, in the mid-60s. Uh, he, he was a great guitar player and he went over to London and he became one of the top session guys in London. Uh, he, he's, he, he was the top guy in London at one stage. I went over to him quite a lot. And he, uh, he was played in... The Palladium, uh, backing the the pantomimes, all that kind of thing, and he also was a session guy in the studio with George Martin. He's on George Martin albums. He recorded with the, uh, he was he's on all the uh, the Osir records. Mm -hmm. uh, you name everybody, right? He, and then he ended up on the Bruce Forsyth show. Anyway, uh, Paul and I have kept in touch all these years, uh, and. He, 
I, I went over and stayed with him and I asked him to, you know, any chance of breaking into the recording scene over there and he says no problem you know and he, he had all the context but I, I didn't like to live in London I wanted to stay here in Ireland you know so mm. that, I, that was a chance that I kind of kind, that's the only regret it's a mild regret yeah. that what would have happened if I had uh, uh, you know went and, and took up his offer you know yeah I, I used to get, well like of course because I took the guitar at a young age and I there wasn't that many guitar players around uh, Clontarf uh, when I started uh, I kind of came the the, what's the word? The mentor, maestro, maestro the me mentor for a lot of go younger guys coming al along. Uh, guys like uh, Doge Nagel and, and believe it or not, uh, th what's that, that Irish guy? Uh, I, I can't think of his name. Uh, you know the compere, uh, Martin Whelan. Marty, oh. Whe Marty Whelan used to come to me for guitar lessons and he ended up taking up the drums. So that'll give you an idea how good a teacher I was. Uh, then I had uh, the most successful guy is Jerry Leonard. He, he became the producer for David Bowie. Jerry came to me for a long, long time. He, he was only a kid out of school. Eamon McCormick? Eamon McCormick, yeah. Uh, Philip Donnelly came for a while. Uh, there's a, a few other guys because because of my age I was older than them. They kind of, I mean, you're talking about these guys were like school, school kids coming out of school and I was like, I was an old man. I was like, uh, 21 and they were like 11 and then uh, uh, Don Baker came to me he wanted to learn the Merrill Travis style and uh, that other brilliant singer uh, Brendan Finglas <laughs> <laughs> who I uh, haven't seen for 40 years but anyway uh, yeah I, I used to take the guitar lessons I had a place in town uh, in one of the shops Nordale Cranes I was there for years Teach I, so many people, but I, I I never really liked. I used to just do it for the money, <laughs> to be honest. But that all that period that you were in the music business, you really enjoyed it from the fifties to the sixties. Well, it was the best time. I mean, yeah. I know I'm an old fogey now, and, and everything. When you're when you're when you're old, you always look back and say that every time, every when you were young was the best time. But I really believe it was. Uh, when I look, I think I was very fortunate to have been born. Any of my generation that were born say in the 40s uh, we got the best deal because the, the war the last the war was f over and uh, from there on there was there was no, hardly any crime there was no drugs the music was fresh it was all new and uh, as it was coming along we were experiencing you know each, each phase each uh, uh, facet of music was coming out every day if you look if you look at for example at a, a say an old NME charts you'll see the list of songs that the top 20 and they're all classics now you know you'll see like and just every, every the variety of stuff you got trad you got ballads you got rock you got blues you got country you got it all you know, like in the one week and they're and most of the songs are you know are all gems now they're they're you know what people you know aspire to create now but nobody seems to be able to do it i, I think the level the standard and the level of, of musicianship and uh composition was very high back then and uh, I, th I think when you're in a, that kind of a, a place where you got people out of a high standard you have to kind of aspire to be that high but if the, if the, if the standard is low it's like it's like art it's like I think everything is, 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 is down here now personally I think it's like art is the same it's everybody's an artist everybody's a writer everybody's a poet everybody's a singer everybody's a guitar player you know uh, but are they any good because there's no quality control anymore as far as I can see and, and everybody's gonna go but it doesn't necessarily mean that.